So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about one from Japan and I don't think I've ever done a Japanese case before. Today we're going to be talking about the case of Junko Furuta and this is also known in Japan as the Concrete Encased High School Girl Murder Case which is a very long name. So I'm just going to be calling it the Junko Furuta case, but it's also known as 44 Days, like some kind of variation of 44 Days. And I'm sure you can guess why, but if not, you're going to find out during the video. So quickly before I get into it, I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video on the case. So so Junko Furuta was a 17 year old girl born on November 22nd 1971 in Misato in Japan. Junko was attending high school at the time of this incident and she also had a part time job and she was just generally very well liked by everyone that knew her, she was quite a popular girl. She was very well behaved, she got good grades, she didn't smoke or drink or do drugs like her other classmates. She was very kind of strong willed in the way that she wouldn't give in to peer pressure like that. So on the evening of November 25th 1988, Junko Furuta finished her shift at her part time job and sat off home on her bike. And at some point during her journey home, Junko was riding past some hedges. And it was then a boy of a similar age to her jumped out from these hedges and kicked her from her bike and then he ran off. Another boy walking on the other side of the street saw this happen and so he ran over to Junko, helped her up and then offered to walk her the rest of the way to her house. And Junko accepted because she actually recognised this boy. His name was Hiroshi Miyano and he actually went to the same school as her and this will come into play later. So the two of them began walking and talking to each other and Junko kind of let her guard down. She calmed down after that incident and Hiroshi began kind of leading where they were going. Hiroshi actually unknowingly led Junko to an abandoned warehouse and once they got there his whole demeanour changed. He began shouting at Junko, pushing her about and claiming that he had connections to the Yakuza which is kind of like the Japanese mafia, like an organised crime group and he was telling Junko that if she didn't do exactly what he said he would get the Yakuza to kill her and so he led her into the warehouse and raped her. Hiroshi then took Junko to a hotel and raped her a further two times there and then he wouldn't let her leave for the rest of the night. It then became clear to Junko why Hiroshi was doing this to her. Like I said earlier, the two of them went to high school together and Hiroshi actually had a bit of a crush on Junko. And he'd actually asked Junko out before but she didn't feel the same way and so she just politely declined. But even though she did do it politely, this probably caused an intense hatred in Hiroshi. Hiroshi had never been rejected like that before. He was a very popular boy. He got everything he wanted. And he didn't make his connections to the Yakuza much of a secret. Everyone knew and everyone was scared of him. But not Junko. Junko was the first girl to ever say no to Hiroshi. And that probably triggered something in his brain that made him want to... Her. So anyway, it was now getting to the early hours of the morning, Hiroshi still had Junko in this hotel room and he was starting to think about what he could do with her next. Hiroshi ran his friends and told them the whole story, everything that he'd done to Junko and all of his friends seemed really excited at the prospect of keeping her around so that they could do the same thing to her. So that same night at around 3am, Hiroshi took Junko to a local park and there they met up with his three friends, Jo, Shinji and Yasushi. And it was then that Junko recognised one of these three friends, Shinji, as the boy that had kicked her off of a bike earlier that day. And then she realised that maybe this was all a huge plan all along. The boys were working together that day to get Junko in a vulnerable position and then Hiroshi would come in, gain her trust and then ultimately do this to her. But what Junko didn't know at the time is that she wasn't the first girl that the boys had done this to. They actually had a history of abduction and gang rape. Not long before this incident, the four boys had kidnapped and gang raped another girl and released her a couple of hours after. They didn't keep her for too long, but she never told anyone about it because she was too scared of Hiroshi and his connections to the Yakuza. So once they all met up at the park, Hiroshi gave the three boys Junko's belongings so that they could look through them, whatever, maybe steal some things. 
And then on one of her notebooks, they actually found her home address. So now the boys actually had something that they could use against Junko. They would tell her that if she didn't do exactly what they said, they now had her address and they knew where her family were. And if she stepped out of line, Hiroshi would send the Yakuza to kill her whole family. So from the park, the four boys took Junko Furuta to Hiroshi's house that he shared with his parents. And this house became kind of like a base for the group. They told Junko to act as one of the boys' girlfriends just in case Hiroshi's parents ever asked, but they never did. In fact, his parents just didn't seem to care. They never questioned the fact that Junko had appeared in their house and was there for the next month and a half. And the parents have since come out and said that they never said anything about this because they didn't quite realise the extent to which this was going on. And quite frankly, they were scared of their own son, Hiroshi, because they knew about his connections to the Yakuza through his friends, and they knew that he wasn't afraid to use them. So after a day or two, Junko Furuta's parents were understandably very concerned about their daughter. She'd gone to work one day and just not returned home, and so they contacted the police. So quickly, a huge manhunt began for Junko, and the boys began to panic. They knew that they had to do something before police eventually tracked her down to their house. And so the boys forced Junko to ring her own parents and tell them that she was safe, that she'd run away, she was with a friend, everything was okay and she didn't want to be found. And they also made Junko beg her own parents to call off the police search for her. And they did because they thought she was happy and safe somewhere with a friend. Junko was made to stop her own rescue. And for the next 40 days, Junko Furuta was subjected to the worst torture imaginable. And the whole time she was completely hopeless. She knew that no one was looking for her. No one was going to save her. She was beaten multiple times a day. She was starved. She was raped multiple times a day. It's believed up to 400 times throughout her captivity. She was hung from the ceiling and used as a punching bag. The boys would force her to lay on the floor and drop huge heavy barbells all over her body, on her stomach, on her limbs. They burned her with cigarettes, with lighters, with candles. They would force her to eat live cockroaches as well as her own feces and urine. One of the boys would hold Junko's head to the concrete floor while another boy jumped on it several times to the point where her nose was so full with blood that she could only breathe out of her mouth. And they would also sexually assault Junko Furuta in other ways, such as forcing her to masturbate in front of them. They would also insert foreign objects into her vagina and into her anus, sometimes both at once. This included an iron rod, a light bulb, scissors, and even fireworks that they would light inside of her. They mutilated her vagina, her clitoris, her eyelids, they pierced both of her nipples and then just pulled her left nipple completely off with pliers and after a week or so the four boys began inviting their other friends round to the house to join in in this torture most notably two other boys named Tetsuo and Koichi. The two of them abused and raped Junko just like the other boys did, although Tetsuo seemed to be the more willing of the two whereas Koichi kind of had to be pressured into it, although he still did it. After leaving Hiroshi's house that day and going home, Koichi's behaviour weighed very heavy on his conscience, and so he decided to confide in his brother exactly what had gone on at Hiroshi's. Koichi's brother then told their parents, who subsequently told the police, all about Junko Furuta, her captivity, her abuse. And so two officers went to Hiroshi's home to go and check this out, to go and see if there was a girl in there being held captive and abused, However, when they got to Hiroshi's house, his parents answered the door. The parents told the police that there was no girl in there, there was nothing going on, although they said, you can come in and have a look if you would want to, you can come and check for yourselves. However, police declined the invite to go in and search the house because they believed that the invite alone was sufficient proof that there wasn't a girl in there being held captive and abused. Because the police thought, why would they be so confident in inviting us in if we're just gonna go in there and find this girl? Surely, if they're that willing for the police to go in, there's not gonna be a girl in there which is such a dangerous way for police to think. But police left Hiroshi's house that day believing that there was no girl in there. They didn't even step foot in the house to check. 
and so another opportunity to rescue Junko Furuta and save her life was missed. In early December, so around two to three weeks into Junko's captivity, she actually managed to sneak away from the boys while they were distracted and found a phone and began to call the police. However, before she could actually say anything to the police, Hiroshi caught her, took the phone off her and then the four boys tortured her as punishment. They doused Junko Furuta's legs in lighter fluid and set them on fire and then sodomised her with a large glass bottle. This caused severe bleeding and Junko actually went into convulsions and the boys thought that she was faking. The boys thought that she was just doing this so that they would stop and so to teach her a lesson to stop her from faking these fits they set her on fire again. Throughout her captivity, Junko pled with the boys multiple times a day to just kill her, to just get it over with. But obviously the boys were having too much fun. They continued to beat and rape her multiple times a day and now they were forcing her to sleep outside on the balcony. And bear in mind, this was mid-December. It was freezing. Temperatures in Japan in the winter can get into minus degrees and Junko was forced to sleep out on the balcony with no blankets. They began locking her in a freezer for periods of time, all while continuing their usual methods of torture, beating, burning, sodomising, raping. And one of the boys recalled Junko being in so much pain from all of her injuries, all over her arms and her legs, her hands, her feet. She was in so much pain that she could barely move. And it actually took her a whole hour to get from upstairs where the boys would keep her downstairs to the bathroom. A full hour. Although eventually Junko Furuta, due to her injuries, just became incontinent, meaning that she would just urinate and defecate without any warning. She couldn't stop herself. And this only gave the boys more fuel to hate Junko and to punish her for. And soon Junko became unable to eat or drink and every time she would try, her body would just reject it and throw it back up and the boys would punish her for that as well. And towards the end of her captivity, Junko Furuta was barely visually recognisable. Because of all of her injuries, her face was so swollen that you could barely make out any of her facial features. And because her body was so burned and damaged and crippled and due to her incontinence, she always smelled bad. And all of this made the boys lose sexual interest in Junko Furuta. And obviously that was one of the main reasons that they were keeping her around. They would rape her multiple times a day. And now the boys didn't really want to do that anymore. They weren't attracted to her anymore. And because of this, the boys decided to go out and find a girl that was sexually appealing to them. And they found a 19 year old girl. Just like Junko a month prior, this 19 year old girl was on her way home from work when the boys stopped her and gang raped her. But unlike what they did with Junko, the boys didn't keep this girl, they let her go home and whatever, and they just returned back to the home where they were keeping Junko. And then one day on January 4th, 1989, as they were all just sat in Hiroshi's house, one of the boys challenged Junko to a game of Mahjong. And Junko actually won this game and this completely set the boys off once again. So the boys began kicking and punching Junko, they beat her with an iron barbell, they burnt her eyelids with fresh hot wax. They made her stand and they whipped her feet with a bamboo stick until she collapsed to the floor and began convulsing once again. At this point, Junko was bleeding so much and all of her old wounds had also reopened and there was pus all over her, there was blood all over her, but the boys didn't plan on stopping there. But they didn't want to get blood and pus all over them so in order to continue beating Junko, they put plastic bags around their hands, taped them up and then just continued. They continued to drop the iron dumbbell on her while she was convulsing. They poured lighter fluid all over her body, including her face this time and set her on fire. And this attack from when Junko won the game, this attack lasted two whole hours. And Junko made multiple attempts to try and put the fire out However, eventually she just became unresponsive. The fire eventually went out on its own, but not long after that, Junko Furuta passed away on January 4th, 1989 from her wounds. Although the boys just assumed she was passed out because she would pass out sometimes when they would beat her so severely, she would just go unconscious for a couple of hours and then come back round and they thought she was just gonna 
come back round. It wasn't until 24 hours after her death that the boys actually realised she was dead and so Hiroshi called his older brother to tell him. So now the boys knew that they had to dispose of Junko's body somehow because they couldn't let this get traced back to themselves and so they wrapped it up in several blankets and put it inside of a travel bag. They placed this travel bag with Junko's body in it in a 55 gallon drum or 208 litre drum and they filled it with wet concrete and then let it set around her and then disposed of it. And since everybody else thought that Junko had just run away, they thought she was safe somewhere, no one was looking for her, no one even knew that she was dead and the boys could have successfully gotten away with this forever. But three weeks later, on January 23rd of 1989, Hiroshi and his friend Joe, so one of the four boys, they were both arrested for the rape of that 19 year old girl that they went out and found when they lost sexual interest in Junko. But at the time of their questioning, so Hiroshi and Joe were being questioned separately from each other. At the time of this, there was a completely separate double murder unsolved double murder going on in this town and police believe that because of this rape of the 19 year old girl that they might also be responsible for that double murder because there were a lot of similarities and so police in Hiroshi's questioning began insinuating that they knew something about a murder and so in Hiroshi's head he was thinking Junko Furuta although police were insinuating about this other double murder. And just by the way, for the record, the boys had nothing to do with this double murder. I don't know who did that, I didn't look into that. I don't know the names of the people that were killed, so I can't really look into that. So anyway, in Hiroshi's questioning, police were kind of implying that they knew something about a murder. And he was thinking Junko Furuta, he thought that maybe Joe had admitted to this murder in his separate questioning. And so Hiroshi just, broke down and told police everything about Junko Furuta and they had no idea that Junko was even dead. They thought that she'd just run away and she was with a friend. They had no idea that she was tortured and murdered for 44 days. Hiroshi told police where they could go to find Junko's body in that concrete drum and the next day they went and found it and so Hiroshi's story could be confirmed 100%. Hiroshi's body was so horrendously disfigured from all of this abuse that she wasn't actually visually identifiable and the only way that they could identify her was from her fingerprints. After Hiroshi's questioning, the other two boys, Yasushi and Shinji, and also Hiroshi's older brother, all three of those were also arrested. At first, despite the severity of the crimes that these boys had committed, they were all under the age of 18, and so all of their identities were kept anonymous from the public. But it wasn't long before journalists from a leading Japanese magazine found out the boys' names and leaked them to the whole world. They believed that whoever was capable of committing such heinous crimes didn't deserve anonymity. And all of the boys took a plea bargain, so rather than pleading not guilty to murder, they pled guilty to committing bodily injury that resulted in death, so that they could get a lesser sentence. In July of 1990, Hiroshi Miyano, who was the leader of the group of boys, was sentenced to 17 years in prison. He actually tried to appeal that sentence, saying that 17 years was too much for what he did and so his case was reviewed but judges believed that 17 years wasn't enough so they gave him an extra three years so then he was serving 20 and his parents were actually ordered to pay Junko Furuta's family some kind of compensation for their son's actions and so they actually had to sell their family home for four hundred thousand dollars so that they could give the Furutas some money. Obviously it wasn't $400,000, it was in Japanese currency, but most of my viewers are American, so I thought I would convert it. And Hiroshi Miyano is now out of prison, living under the name Hiroshi Yokoyama in Japan. Shinji Minato was originally sentenced to four to six years, so between four and six years, but just like Hiroshi, he appealed it, and his sentence was raised to five to nine years. And Shinji's parents weren't ordered to pay the Furutas any kind of compensation for their son's actions. I think it was just Hiroshi's because it happened under their roof and 
they were negligent to tell police about it when they knew that something was going on, whether they knew the extent of it or not. After Shinji was released from prison, he moved in with his mother and he has been unemployed ever since this happened, so for 20 years. Yasushi Watanbe originally received three to four years in prison and then appealed and that was increased to five to seven years. Joe Ogura spent eight years in a juvenile prison and was released in 1999 Yet on his release, and actually the whole time he was at the juvenile prison, he would brag to people, to his friends, about how he raped and killed Junko Furuta. So after his release, Joe went on to get a job and a wife and just live a kind of normal life. That was up until July of 2004. Joe was arrested for assaulting a man that he believed that his wife was cheating on him with. But this was no kind of spur of the moment fight or something like that. Joe tracked down this man, beat him, shoved him in the back of his van and then drove him miles away to a bar that his mother owned. He then took this man into the bar and beat him for a further four hours, the whole time telling him that he was gonna kill him, that he'd killed before and he knew how to get away with it. And for this incident, Joe was imprisoned for seven years and upon his release, he changed his name to Joe Kamisaku. And Joe's mother has allegedly vandalized Junko Furuta's grave stating that she did so because Junko ruined her son's life. All we know about Joe and how he's living now is that he's blown all of his family savings on luxury goods, holidays, stuff like that. And all of that was money that was supposed to be going to the Furutas. But yeah, that completes this video. Thank you so, so much for watching. A really, 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 really heavy one. I am going to be covering the Sylvia Likens case at some point. I don't like to do cases like this very frequently just because they are so heavy and... And it leaves me feeling very sad after it. I don't know about you. Like all of the cases that I cover on this channel are sad but I hate knowing that someone was in pain for so long. Which is why I very rarely cover abduction and abuse cases because the people are often in pain for a long, long time before they eventually die. And stuff like that just weighs very heavy on me and I imagine it weighs very heavy on you too. So I don't like to do them too frequently, but I will still do them if they are recommended to me, just like this one was. But yeah, I will be covering the Sylvia Likens case, which is very similar to this, and so, so many of you wanted me to cover that when I did it very briefly in the horror films that were inspired by true events video. So I will cover that at some point, it might be in January now because I don't want to do them too close together. But thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a big thumbs up and subscribe down below if you want to see some more from me. A huge thank you to all of my channel members. All of their names are on screen right now. If you want to become a channel member, you can just click the link in the description or if you're on a desktop, you can click the join button under the video. If you become a channel member, you'll get your name on this end card and you'll also have access to a members only community tab where I will ask for case suggestions, do polls to see what cases come next. And yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.